Four years ago, SpaceX's team made its mark in the hearts of fans with the successful free-flying hop of Star Hopper, the first prototype of the Starship program to be built. By far, Starship is no longer a water tower that can only fly, but is also the most powerful and heaviest rocket in the world. Yeah! Four years is not too long, but it is enough for SpaceX to show the world how crazy Starship's development is. However, the rapid development of this vehicle began to be most clearly demonstrated through two integrated test flights in April and recently. Given that, in its second launch, the entire rocket industry had the opportunity to witness a completely different version of Starship than it was nearly seven months ago. This marks a massive breakthrough improvement in the journey to help this vehicle reach orbit. So what makes IFTO2 stand out more than IFTO1? discuss everything about this in today's episode of TechMap. Compared to the April 20th test, the November 18th event marks the debut of over 1,000 changes that SpaceX has made on both Stage Zero and the rocket. With these upgrades, Elon Musk went from the goal of not blow up on the launch pad that he set before IFTO-1 to a 90-minute trip around the world and splashing down in the ocean in IFTO-2. So, it's time to review the key changes that contributed to the success of this test flight. It would be a mistake if we did not pay attention to the appearance of the water deluge system on the launch pad, which was used to disperse and absorb the powerful exhaust gases of the 33 Raptor engines. The system showed high reliability in actual pre-flight tests, although some were skeptical about how it would respond to 16.7 million pounds of thrust. Ultimately, SpaceX has not let them down. During the test flight, it was clearly seen that the system was activated on time. The exhaust gases of the 33 engines flowed out and then reacted with water from pipes to form beautiful white clouds. This scene is a complete contrast to the death scene in IFT-01, featuring the black smoke filled with debris and dirt as the remnants of an attack by 33 monsters on OLM. Musk is very grateful for this water-based flame deflector because it protects the launch pad and thus helps SpaceX avoid the most of troubles with the government agencies that held up its flight plan during the past several months. On November 19th, he shared pictures of the current launch pad along with positive words, just inspected the Starship launch pad and it is in great condition. No refurbishment needed to the water-cooled steel plate for next launch. Congrats to SpaceX team and contractors for engineering and building such a robust system so rapidly. The FAA previously also confirmed that. No injuries or public property damage have been reported. Although the national agency still is going to oversee the SpaceX-led mishap investigation, both the company's CEO and everyone else believes this won't have much of an impact on the progress of the third Starship test flight. Yeah, this inspires Elon to set an even more ambitious timeline for the next step. Starship Flight 3 hardware should be ready to fly in three to four weeks. There are three ships in final production in the high bay as can be seen from the highway. Okay, let's come back to the test. On the 18th, following the first success on OLM, Starship continued to rush strongly into the sky with the support of all 33 Raptor engines. No failures on the Raptor were recorded during the first minutes of acceleration, suggesting that most of the problems on the Raptor had been fixed well. During the ascent of IFT-01, Hydraulic failures in the thrust vectoring system caused multiple engines to be unactivated, resulting in the Starship losing speed. For that reason, the hydraulic thrust vectoring system has been replaced by the electronic system, helping 33 Raptor engines maintain stable operation and improving the Starship's pace. The gap in speed between the two flights has been clearer after the max Q point. The IFT-01 rocket was only traveling at 750 kilometers per hour, while the rocket this time was double at 1380 thanks to the increased thrust-to-weight ratio. However, the environment inside the booster remained a challenge for the Raptor, as during this flight, multiple engines shut down in mid-flight. According to it, after the separation event occurred, 
Super Heavy reignited the second ring of the Raptor to provide maximum gimbal for the flip maneuver and at the same time kick off the boost backburn. However, this is where the problem occurs. One engine failed, followed by several core engine failures, and finally they all shut down. The unsuccessful center core engine reignition could have contributed to the final rapid unscheduled disassembly. But at least the Super Heavy got the main engine cut off, which is something that Ship 24 and Booster 7 sadly missed. In reality, they only fly at about 2,200 kilometers per hour. At an altitude of about 35 kilometers, approach their engines cut off but too slow to reach any orbit. In contrast, Booster 9 has a twice speed at 5,500 kilometers per hour and an altitude of 65 kilometers. No matter what had already happened with its booster, Ship 25 was determined with its journey. Six smoothly running engines played a vital role in helping the spacecraft climb to an altitude of 148 kilometers, or about 485,000 feet, roughly four times the peak altitude that Ship 24 reached. More importantly, it went more than 24,000 kilometers per hour, close to orbital velocity, so much better than its predecessor, which even had not had a chance to fly by itself. Unfortunately, we cannot witness the ship complete its 90-minute trip around the world and splash down gracefully in the Pacific Ocean northwest of Hawaii. But we might get a chance to watch this because SpaceX is collecting the necessary data from IFT-02 to boost Raptor's reliability in the third test when the company plans to test the electricity soft landing on the ship, meaning the ship's engine ability to reignite after re-entry. It's an essential step toward the goal of using Mechazilla to catch Starship. Based on that analysis, we can see clearly how important the engine is as its reliable performance at first minutes on this flight paved the way for the most desired event, namely, hot staging separation. SpaceX once again set a record by successfully applying a system that was used on Russian rockets to an American rocket of this size. This promises to increase the payload capacity on the future Starship rockets by 10%. Maybe you missed this interesting information. In IFT-01, Starship had no separation mechanism at all. The vehicle's stage separation initially followed the satellite deployment system used on Falcon 9 launches of Starlink V1 and V1.5 satellites. The Falcon 9 upper stage gets put into an end-over-end -end rotation and simply releases the tension rod that fixes the satellites to the payload adapter. This sudden loss of the centripetal force then flings the satellites out into space due to the centrifugal force. Similarly, right before the main engine cut off, the Super Heavy would gimbal its engines, causing the vehicle to start rotating. By using the booster's gimbling Raptor engines to impart a small but significant rotation on the rocket moments before separation, Super Heavy could effectively flick Starship away from it. This method is quite effective, but also causes the vehicle to lose speed, given that as you shut down the lower stage engines, the rocket stops accelerating forward. Gravity and air resistance start robbing velocity. Back the April 20th, both Ship 24 and Booster 7 could not separate from each other because the main engine cutoff did not occur. At the same time, the SpaceX team noticed that a fire in the engine had severed the connection between the ground computer system and the engine group. Not long after, the automatic flight termination system was triggered to destroy Starship, but it was delayed about 40 seconds longer than expected. Learning from that mistake. SpaceX focused on enhancing it as well as adding more explosives to ensure the vehicle was destroyed immediately after the abort command was issued. To date, no errors in the system have been recorded. Although the Starship's second flight test ended with another explosion, compared to the first time it is considered a success given that the vehicle has done the hot staging separation that we really wanted to see. The OLM is still safe and the Raptor is so much better. Optimistically, the probability of Starship reaching orbit this time is up by about 60%, as Elon expected. So why not hold out hope that Starship's third test will go much more smoothly and that the upper stage will reach orbit? And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification feature so you don't miss any space-important updates. 
Your support is our driving force to continue delivering high quality content. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you next time.